Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We're starting a series of Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church entitled, The Least of These, Ministering to Those in Need. And this is the last lesson in that series, lesson number 13 for September 28 of 2019, <coughs> entitled, A Community of Servants. Hmm, wonder what that would be about. Well, let's see if we can figure it out. But as always, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, it's hard for us to imagine what it will be like if everyone living on our planet really behaved the way you wanted them to do. Just imagine what an incredible ex exercise that would be, an incredible experience it would be. Of course, we would be ready for the kingdom of heaven. Lord, help us in this discussion today to get a little taste of what that would be like is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. How could we work together, not, not just as individuals, we need to do that too, but how could we work together in some ways to, as a church or maybe as a Sabbath school class, to promote the gospel? Can, can, we, can we do things as groups? What kind of things could we do as groups? Obviously, we can do things individually. We can give Bible studies. And sometimes some groups have been very successful at taking two or three people together jointly conducting a Bible study. Sometimes that works very well. That would be one possibility. What are, but what are some things that we could do as, as a group that would distinctly be separate from what we could do as an individual? Any, things, any kinds of things pop in your mind? Well, our church here at Loma Linda cooperates with several other churches in operating a, a pantry. That's something you can't do all by yourself. You, so you can feed the hungry, you can clothe the naked, provide housing where possible to those at home. What that pantry would, what that pantry does? Well, it's a pantry located just next to. The clinic where I work, we feed about 1,500 people a week out of that pantry, giving out food. And, and a number of the big um, chain store, the chain grocery stores, deliver stuff to us because they appreciate the fact that they old bread and that kind of stuff. They appreciate the fact that something good can have come out of this instead of just throwing it away. So are meals served there or is food? No, it's, it's food is given Fresh. to people. People come groceries. and pick up what groceries and so forth and mm -hmm. take them home. Yeah. You'd have to get licensed by the state to cook food and stuff. You, yeah, I think spe so. special hurdles that you have to do in order to yeah. for that to be uh, but an ongoing I, thing. That's interesting to say that because I remember working earlier a number of years ago with a group that just they just sort of came together and cooked meals and gave it to anybody and I wanted Maybe they had a license, but I, well, <laughs> I, it, you probably do need a license. Well, you have to have your 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 cooking area yeah. uh, inspected. It has to meet certain qualifications, just maybe, as a restaurant does. Maybe that's why, after a while, they closed the whole place down. Mm -hmm. well, that could be. <laughs> that happened Hill. here. Campus Hill it looks uh, look after. It's a church. You need uh, yeah. people might not know that. Yeah, well, it's next door to the university church. They provide food for students that are here on a student visa. Some of these yeah. people have got nothing to eat and no yeah. money, and they give them meals and others too, all the time. So I want you to think, uh, in our, during the course of this lesson, think about what you and your Sabbath school class, for example, might do in your community to reach out to the poor and the needy. Look at 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 to 20. Christ is like a single body, which has many parts. It is still one body, even though it is made up of different parts. In the same way, all of us, whether Jews or Gentiles, whether slaves or free, have been baptized into the one body by the same Spirit. And we have all been given the one Spirit to drink. For the body itself is not made up of only one part, but of many parts. At the foot were to say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, that would not keep it from being a part of the body. And if the ear were to say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, that would not keep it from being a part of the body. If the whole body were just an ear, how, an eye, how could it hear? 
And if it were only an ear, how could it smell? And it is as it is, however, God put every different part of the body just as he wanted it to be. There would, there would not be a body if it were all only one part. As it is, there are many parts, but one body. So, in this passage, Paul compares the body of Christ, that is the church, to a human body. Not every church member has the same skills or the same gifts, but working together we can accomplish a great deal. So, what kind of different skills are there, for example, in your Sabbath school class? I know some of us here, one time or another, in the past, have, have been where with a group of people, said, okay, what's, you, what is, what's your skill? What's your gift? What's your gift? What's your gift to each person around the way? Um, that would be an interesting ex- exercise in a small Sabbath school class, trying to figure out how those gifts could fit together. Uh, you, there's an interesting experience, and I just saw one on television during the news. I, I never have time to listen to anything except the news. This last week, that was quite remarkable. Um, there are groups that were, this was quite common a few years ago, a couple of years ago, choir groups would go and they would go into a restaurant and all of a sudden they're eating and then all of a sudden one person stands up and starts singing and pretty soon the whole group is standing up and singing. I mean, everybody, you can imagine, everybody, whoa, you know, and of course these are people who, you know, are very good at singing, perfect harmony and so forth. It's just quite a, quite an incredible experience. So could that happen to a Sabbath school class in spreading the gospel? We don't have to sing. Could we do things like that that would bring people to Christ? Well, there's, uh, in our Sabbath school class, mm-hmm. uh, the gathering place, we have musicians that were leading out in the song service, and and then we started doing uh, vespers, and and then we go, now we have programs on, t- on LLBN, mm-hmm. uh, and we go to nursing homes and retirement centers and Good. and lead out investors and things so that's so funny. some of your people pay different instruments and do some of them talk what all what all did you do uh some talks uh explaining the history of the hymns mm-hmm. and uh and then we sing those and then we interact with people afterwards our lesson is going to challenge us to think about the very early christian church those people came together, they basically lived together, they ate together, they, and for whatever reason, I don't know, and I, maybe that's the first question I should ask you. Do those thousands of people who joined the Christian church right in the, in the very early days of the Christian church, were those people who had been sort of standing by, been influenced by Jesus, and they joined because of what Jesus had already done? Or do you think... A lot of people joined, and this was their first time at Pentecost, for example, of hearing about the gospel. I've often thought about that. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the people, like, for instance, the 5,000 that Jesus fed, how many of them were there for the, for the Passover? Yeah. Uh, How many were there, you know, when Jesus was, was crucified? How many, you know, they, uh, all of them must have heard the, sto- the story of Jesus before then. Yeah. And, and imagine if you had been suffering from ter- some terrible disease and Jesus had healed you. Yeah. I mean, yeah. We have the story of the demoniac or demoniacs mm-hmm. that Jesus healed over in Gentile territory. And he didn't say, come with me. He said, go tell the people that around you what... I have done for you. Mm-hmm. And what happened when he, when Jesus came back to that territory? Thousands, Thousands came. So I suspect that may be just what happened, at, you know, that these people had heard Jesus talk and now were convinced. And I would like to read you, uh, since you mentioned that, I'd like to read you a couple of verses that might shock people. But this is in the Bible. It's true, I'm sure. Look first at Acts 6, verse 7. And so, um, and so the word of God continued to spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem grew larger and larger, and a great number of priests accepted the faith. And what group of people were priests? 
priests or the Sadducees? Primarily the Sadducees. Did you realize that a great number of Sadducees became Christians? And that's not all. Let me show you another verse. They had to start believing in the resurrection. Yeah, what about that? Look at look at uh, Acts 15, verse 5. But some of the believers who had belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said the Gentiles must be circumcised and told to obey the law of Moses. So these people still had some Pharisaical leanings, but a number of people who had been Pharisees were now members of the Christian group. Wow. So, all that working together, obviously they were effective at reaching out to other members of their community, but they were certainly not reaching out to Gentiles. It took years and severe persecution to get them to do that. Why do you suppose that is? Um, Remember? Yeah, their Jewish prejudice against others. Remember the stoning of Stephen, chapter Acts 8, verse 1, and Saul approved of his murder. And then the next sentence, that very day the church in Jerusalem began to suffer cruel persecution. All the believers except the apostles were scattered throughout the provinces of Judea and Samaria. Wow. Scattered throughout the provinces. Well, the good news is, what did they do when they were scattered? They preached to the Jews. They, yeah, they carried the gospel to the Jews. But then we get to chapter 11 in Acts, verse 19, and this is what we read. Some of the believers who were scattered by the persecution which took place when Stephen was killed went as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, telling the message to Jews only. But other believers who were from Cyprus... And Cyrene, where is Cyrene located? Libya. North Africa. What is now Libya. Went to Antioch. So here we have Christian missionaries going from Libya to Syria. Think about that in our day. And proclaimed the message to Gentiles also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's power was with them and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. Guess what happens when you follow God's advice? Well, We're told in Romans 12, verse 1. I'm just going to read that first verse here. So then, my brothers and sisters, because of God's great mercy to us, I appeal to you, offer yourselves as a living sacrifice to God, dedicated to His service and pleasing to Him. This is the true worship that you should offer. Okay, living sacrifices, true worship. What does that mean? More than lip service. Yeah, more than lip services, yes. Any other, Anything more than that? Well, if we had time to read these other passages, I don't want to read all of them. It says we're supposed to be a part of Christ's body. We're supposed to be ambassadors. We're supposed to even bring a sweet smelling. I guess we would, we're supposed to be perfume. Any of you feel comfortable being perfume? What's interesting, if you go to the Old Testament, Leviticus, what, where's the, what's the perfume in Leviticus? Burning flesh. Burning flesh. Have any of you ever smelled burning flesh? Mm-hmm. Not a sweet smell in my nostrils, I can tell you that. But in New Testament times, very quickly, the offering of dead animals became no longer a part of the Christian plan. We are to be living sacrifices. What does that mean? For I have died and yet I live, yet it is no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. Okay, and what does that mean? It means that I reckon myself uh, as dead. I don't... Uh, uh, he who seeks to save his life shall lose it. He who seeks to lose his life for my sake will save it unto eternal life. So okay. we uh, treat ourselves as as dead and we seek to follow Jesus and allow his life to work in us through through us. For 30 years of his life, Jesus worked in a quiet carpenter shop. Well, probably not the first five or years or so, but 25 years of his life then. He worked in a quiet carpenter shop and probably did 
an excellent job, made good furniture <coughs> and tables and I don't know whatever he did. What Maybe they built houses too, I just don't know. Do you think that's all he did? No. What did he do besides just make good furniture? Made friends. Yeah. Made friends, exactly. And he had time with people. And it's very clear from Scripture and Fair from ideas. Ellen White, it's very clear that each one of us is supposed to, you know, and she talks about mechanics and people like that. Our, we may have a job that helps us to support ourselves, but our primary job is what? Spreading the gospel. That's what Jesus did. That was that was his main focus. So how do we do that in in what we're doing? Part of our profession, whatever it is, uh, okay, that's fine, but the goal of that should be spreading the gospel, being living sacrifices. And our churches, I mean, it's very clear that churches are organized for what purpose? To spread the gospel. They're not country clubs that you come together once a week and just enjoy uh, someone doling out something to you. They're supposed to be places of service, places where where, where the gospel is just spreading out to everybody. Well, in Second Corinthians 5, we know that God has attempted to make the whole human race his friends through Christ. What is implied by that statement? He goes on to say in, in 2 Corinthians 5, 19, God did not keep an account of their sins. What does that mean? Didn't treat them as their sins deserve. We have a lot of Christian forebears, Protestants, who have given the impression that the only thing that you need to accomplish is get God to forgive your sins so he won't be angry with you and then you can be saved. Is that what's happening here? It says God doesn't even keep an account of people's sins. Well, our approaching to God is not going to uh, work because our our sins separate us from Him. Mm -hmm. In other words, if it's me initiating the process, the sins will get in the way. Mm -hmm. But God initiating the process, overlooking the sins, reaches it out to us, and we have uh, we could pull up a number of texts. Yeah. You know, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, for instance. But how, what does that mean? Because God is forgiveness personified. Everybody is forgiven, including yeah. Bin Laden. Uh, so, well, but they're not. If we don't forgive others, neither will the Father forgive us. Jesus said. So, not everybody is well, forgiveness is offered to everybody, but not everybody. Uh, yeah. And we have we're in a state of grace as well. Ellen White said, "There's an atmosphere of grace." So people are not treated as if they were. Well, here's here's the question: <clears throat> Do we think of ourselves in our daily walks, the, what we do all day long? Do we think of ourselves as speaking on God's behalf, drawing people to love Him and understand Him? Well, I hope so. I mean, just in our interaction with people, showing mm -hmm. concern, making friends. Mm -hmm. Well, here's my verses about perfume. But thanks be to God for in union with Christ, we are always led by God as prisoners in Christ's victory procession. God uses us to make the knowledge about Christ spread everywhere like a sweet fragrance. So that's the kind of perfume you're supposed to be. For we are like a sweet-smelling incense offered by Christ to God, which spreads among those who are being saved and those who are being lost. For those who are being lost, it is a deadly stench that kills. But for those who are being saved, it is a fragrance that brings life. Who then is capable of such a task? Wow. So, are people attracted to the church by what we do? Even more important than that, are they attracted to God? Well, there, there's two elements there. One is the attraction, but then there's also the inhibition. There, there mm -hmm. are people who uh, might be attracted to a God of love, but then they hear that uh, that God's going to torture them throughout eternity. We were listening to a sermon uh, by someone who that was his state of mind yeah. before he uh, was ex it was explained to him what the Bible really said, and and there was another one I forget which one it was, but. Uh, there are things that keep 
people away. Um, and so it might take something to overcome those. Yeah. English. I think the average secular person that you spend time with initially, most people don't have any awareness of their need for forgiveness or the fact that there is a God who even loves him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very often that's and They're true. just going through life and trying to find something to make life interesting. Well, <clears throat> in our international law, as international law is set up, when we, for example as the United States have an embassy in some country somewhere, that little piece that's our embassy is considered to be a part of the United States, no matter where it is. And those countries have a little piece of their country in ours. So, if we are Christians, are we little pieces of the Christian nation planted in the world? Well, our citizenship is not here, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. Well, we as Seventh-day Adventists have claimed that we have a very special claim on God's <clears throat> righteousness, His gifts, and so forth. There are three verses, Revelation 12, 17. I'm going to read these three verses. The dragon was furious with the woman and went off to fight against the rest of her descendants, all those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to the truth revealed by Jesus. And then Revelation 14, 12, this calls for endurance on the part of God's people, those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to Jesus. And then we turn to Revelation 19, 10. We read just the last part there. For the truth that Jesus revealed is what inspires the prophets, or as the King James says, the, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And how do we interpret that? How do you put that all together? We are the ones who keep the commandments right. We are the ones who have the spirit of prophecy. Well, nobody else knows what that is, so I guess that's why we're the only ones who have it. <laughs> we believe that the writings of Ellen White are the spirit of prophecy, and I think that's a valid concern, but a valid claim. But we need to, we should all be speaking the word of tr truth for God. But there's more to that story than we usually know. Who's going to read for us Revelation 12, 14, 12? This calls for endurance on the part of God's people, those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to Jesus. Okay, and that's the message at the end of the three angels' messages, which is what we're, the message we're supposed to be taking out to the whole world. But... That's not the only place where something like that is said. Dennis? Revelation 13.10 Whoever is meant to be captured will surely be captured. Whoever is meant to be killed by the sword will surely be killed by the sword. This calls for endurance and faith on the part of God's people. Whoa! So, that sounds the last little part of that sounds almost exactly like what we read in the following chapter, Revelation 14. So what we see here is that there is going to come a time when there are two great forces, the ones on God's side and the ones on Satan's side, in conflict. And both sides are going to be fighting for followers. And in both of those contexts, what is God calling us to do? To endure. You better be faithful and, and endure. Well... Well, he's looking for faith at the end. Well, the Son of Man, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith in the earth? And uh, he who endures to the end will be saved. Yep. Back in Exodus 32, I don't have time to read the whole story, but there is a story about, Je about Moses after the time when the children of Israel rebelled at the foot of Mount Sinai. And what did Moses say to God? God spoke to Moses and talked about your people, this is God speaking to Moses, your people whom you led out of Egypt. Moses replied with the Lord, why should you be so angry with your people whom you rescued from Egypt? <laughs> I, everybody who has a, experience as a parent is chuckling right now. Does this sound like a couple of parents arguing over their children? Yes. Passing the They're book. your yes. kids. Yes. yes. Did God really change his mind when Moses argued like this? 
He was just drawing Moses out. Yeah. Margaret, I think you have a couple of comments on that. Yeah. <coughs> Malachi 3 6 says, I am the Lord, I do not change. And so you, the descendants of Jacob, are not yet completely lost. And also from Hebrew 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So how do we explain the fact that, quote, God changed his mind when Moses pleaded with him? I think Dennis's comment is part of God's method of education. You yeah. know, you got to show some contrast. This, something that's logical against something that's illogical. Yeah. And not... So. I'm I'm quite convinced that God, that God knew in advance exactly how Moses was going to yeah. respond, but he needed to demonstrate he was getting ready to take Moses to heaven, and he needed to demonstrate to the onlooking universe what kind of a person Moses really was. I think that was a wonderful demonstration. Kind of like he did when Job mm -hmm. was center stage. Do you think Moses felt like he knew God pretty well when he started arguing with God? <laughs> he, he, would not yes. have, he would not have argued with him if he didn't really know him. Not only that, we know that Moses was very concerned about God's reputation. Mm -hmm. His comment was, what will the Egyptians say? And the other nations. What will and the be? other nations. Yeah. If you destroy those people. So, now, let me ask you a question. It's not your nature. How many of you out there specifically ask yourself day by day, what can I do to preserve and exalt God's reputation? Now, we all, I can remember a time when we made a big campaign. We wanted everybody to think well about the Seventh-day Adventist Church, which is not a bad thing. But what would happen if we had a, reputation, I mean, a, a campaign to make God look good? Would that be appropriate? It would. And we live in a world now when so many people aren't sure that God even exists. And they certainly don't believe that the devil exists. And, and on the other side, so many, other, so many Christians, the only thing they think about when they think about Christianity is, how can I get saved? Does that sound just a little bit selfish? Mm-hmm. Well, God will take you any way He can get you selfish, <laughs> unself, whatever. Yeah. Well, if you're if you're aware, because until you have a relationship with God, you don't have much to give. You may try to meddle in people's lives and try to help them, and and it may be God that's stirring you to that, but. We have to see our own limitations and how sinful we are. When we understand the great controversy and the, the accusations that Satan has made against God, that should inspire us to, to stand up for God's reputation every opportunity we get. The minimum requirement for heaven is a willingness to listen and take instruction. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you don't want to, what, what can God do? It can, it lets you go, it lets you do your own thing. God is going to take us horrible sinners and change us over time. Mm -hmm. That's what he's trying to do. That's called yeah. healing. If we let him. Yeah, if we let him. If we let him. Okay. Jim. Moses made an interesting comment to God. Yeah. He says, please forgive their sin, but if you won't, then rem remove my name from the book in which you have written the names of your people. Exodus thirty-two, thirty-two. 32. Notice it's still your people. <laughs> and that's the end of that long discussion. Your people? Whose people? Your people. What was Moses really trying to say? Was he say he didn't want to go to heaven if his friends and family couldn't be there? No. Well, what was he trying to say, Gordon? Patriarchs and Prophets, page 319, paragraph 2. As Moses interceded for Israel, his timidity was lost in his deep interest and love for those for whom he had, in the hands of God, been the means of doing so much, the Lord listened to his pleadings and granted his unselfish prayer. Would God have not have done that otherwise? Well, I'm... God had proved his servant. He had tested his faithfulness exactly. and his love for that erring, ungrateful people, 
and nobly had Moses endured the trial. His interest in Israel sprang from no selfish motive. The prosperity of God's chosen people was dearer to him than personal honor, dearer than the privilege of becoming the father of a mighty nation. God was pleased with his faithfulness, his simplicity of heart, and his integrity, and he committed to him as a faithful shepherd the great charge of leading Israel to the promised land. Wow. Yeah. Patriarchs and Prophets 319. Oh, that's a real message. Well, in our churches it is often the case that groups will determine to do something for the gospel. Some groups are going to focus on social work, reaching out into the community to feed and clothe and help other people. Other groups want to focus on witnessing. How do we get these two camps to cooperate? Wasn't that what Jesus wanted? He said, reach out and do something nice for the community and then tell them about God. Myra? Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching people. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. Then he bade them follow me. The poor were to be relieved, the sick cared for, the sorrowing and bereaved comforted, the ignorant instructed, and the inexperienced counseled. We are to weep with those who that weep and rejoice with those that rejoice. That's from Ministry of Healing, uh, page 143. Then Matthew 10, 7 and 8 says, Go and preach. The kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick and bring the dead back to life. Heal those who suffer from dreaded skin disease and drive out demons. You have received without paying, so give without being paid. So how would that those two verses, Matthew 10, 7, 8, how do you think those should be applied? How should we apply them in our day? I can't raise, I can't bring somebody back to life. But we can give what we will. But we can give what we have. Mm -hmm. That's that's the important thing is that, you know, what's in your hand? What, What do you have to give? And if it isn't enough, then go to the giver of all good gifts and ask for more. I have a patient that I've cared for for a couple years now. And the last time I saw her, well, yeah, the last time I saw her, we discovered that she had a huge cancer in her lung. Mm. And now she's got hard little lumps here and there. You can even feel them in the skin. You know that she's cancer spread all over the place. And you just wonder, you know, you know, there's nothing that physically we can do, whatever medicine and so forth we have. You know, here's somebody dying right in front of you, and you just wish I had the touch of Jesus. Yes, but you may have the touch that gives them everlasting life. Oh, and, and I can say that we have the touch that makes her at least feel accepted and appreciated and, and sympathized with. Well, we can't do all these things that Jesus did. And you know how that's being used. A lot of fraudulent evangelists are pretending to heal people and then claiming that since Jesus has given them the power to heal people, what they are saying must be straight from God. But it's obviously not from God if you just have to compare what they say with what the Bible says. So what did Peter and Paul later have to say about good works and their witness witnessing power? First Peter 2.12 Your conduct among the heathen should be so good that when they accuse you of being evildoers they will have to recognize your good deeds and so praise God on the day of his coming. Good News Bible. Philippians 2.15 and 16 so that you may be innocent and pure as God's perfect children who live in a world of corrupt and sinful people. You must shine among them like stars lighting up the sky as you offer them the message of life. If you do so, I shall have, excuse me, I shall have reason to be proud of you on the day of Christ because it will show that all my effort and work have not been wasted. That's, of course, Paul talking. Also the good news Bible. Yeah. Look at first, um, 
John chapter 3, verses 16 to 18. This is how we know what love is. Christ gave his life for us. We too then ought to give our lives for our brothers and sisters. Rich people who see a brother or sister in need yet close their hearts against them cannot claim that they love God. My children, our love should not be just words and talk. It must be true love which shows itself in action. Wow. What does it mean to give our lives for our brothers and sisters? We've sort of talked about that already. Can I our own um, deny part of ourself in order to uh, to meet their needs? Does does brothers and sisters include people outside the church? Yes, it well, yeah. might. Although they were to pay a special attention to those in the fellowship. Sure. But uh, there's a dynamic pro- process in Acts. They were being added to their group daily. Mm-hmm. So it was. there were people coming in all the time. Yeah, Carrie, I think you have some comments about what Jesus did. Yes. This is John 13, 34 and 35. And now I give you a new commandment. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. If you have love for one another, then everyone will know that you are my disciples. The Good News Bible. Yeah, I like to compare that passage, a very important passage, with Matthew 5.16, where it says, In the same way your light must shine before people so that they will see the good things you do and praise you. Is that what it says? Praise your Father in heaven. How many of the things we do lead people to praise God. Do we shine as lights in the community? I think that's a goal. I'm not sure we always see that happening on a day-to-day basis in most of our lives. But we, we represent the kingdom. We have often talked about the silent witness. We try to do something nice for people and we hope they're going to ask us about the gospel. Is that the way it should be? That would be disinterested benevolence that she okay. talks about, just doing it for the sake that they need they need it, not trying to get a hook in them and is there yeah, that's true, but are there ways in which we should be sort of starting these conversations? Can be we have to I okay. think God opens the door if you pray in the morning you'll see a miracle happen sometime that day yeah. if you spend time with people. It's just over and over. Well, think of the whole story of Job. Wow. Imagine God staking his reputation on the response of Job. Hmm. If you read those first two chapters, then you need to make sure that you go over and read Job 42, verses 7 and 8. After the Lord had finished speaking to Job, he said to Eliphaz, I am angry with you and your two friends because you did not speak the truth about me as my servant Job did. Now take seven bulls and seven rams to Job and offer them as a sacrifice for yourselves. Job will pray for you and I will answer his prayer and not disgrace you as you deserve. You did not speak the truth about me as he did. And we know that some of the things they said about God were just awful. Well, I shrank that down into about three or four words. Huh? The message of the friends of Job. Hmm? They made God, they accused God of being punishing and destroying. Hmm? That's that was the message of the friends of Job. So when you talk about friends of Job, that is not a compliment. Hmm? That's right. Well, <clears throat> Ephesians three ten and Colossians one nineteen and twenty, which I'm not going to take time to read right now say that God intends to teach the rest of the universe something about himself to the church on this earth. Is the rest of the universe looking at us right now to see how we're representing God? Will God finally manage to bring the whole universe back to himself through his son's blood on the cross? Well, I have a question about that. It it almost sounds like the rest of the universe has fallen. Mm. I, I don't see. I no. see them as having questions, 
Uh, but I don't know that they need to be brought back so much as have things clarified. Okay. So many Christians believe that the purpose of the death of Christ was and is to pay the price for our sins. But there is so much more involved than that. And I want to read a very important passage from Ellen White. But the plan of redemption had a yet broader and deeper purpose than the salvation of man, and of course that includes women. It was not for this alone that Christ came to the earth. It was not merely that the inhabitants of this little world might regard the law of God as it should be regarded, but it was to vindicate the character of God before the universe. How do we accomplish that? To this result of his great sacrifice, its influence upon the intelligences of other worlds, as well as upon man, the Savior looked forward when just before his crucifixion he said, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all unto me. The act of Christ in dying for the salvation of man would not only make heaven accessible to men and women, but before all the universe it would justify God and his Son in their dealing with the rebellion of Satan. It would establish the perpetuity of the law of God and would reveal the nature and the results of sin. Amen. And wow. If you go back to that word salvation and substitute healing, mm -hmm. it could have a better impact because people don't understand what, in general what salvation or save means. It's health or healing makes a lot more sense. Eight Direction Prophets 68 and 69. Wow. What is implied by the statement in Ephesians 2.19 that the church community is supposed to be the household of God or members of the family of God? Do people see us like that? We're practicing the yeah. principles of the kingdom. Should we be inviting non-members to our potlucks and gatherings to show them what good friends we are? How do they? How does an outsider, or a person not of our church, observe how we love each other within the church? Isn't that what was John, the, the passage you read us, John thirteen thirty four and thirty five? They're supposed to see how we treat each other. I, when you said that phrase what good friends we are, what good friend I am. The focus is so on me. And the whole thing with Jesus is that when he went out into the villages, he had empathy and compassion on them. His focus <laughs> was all on them and giving them what he had. So when I go to somebody... What do I have? What has God given me today? What do I have to offer? Mm -hmm. And the focus should be on you and you and you and you. The needs of the other person. Yes, yes, hundred okay. percent. Uh, it just cannot. Uh, anyway, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. And if throw, they see the love of God, throw a little us, bit of water into your pot there. Oh, I love water. Pot. Paul said, imitate me then just as I imitate Christ. Would we dare to say that? To somebody else? You'd have to know him pretty well. Working for the Lord isn't easy. We may be embarrassed about speaking up. But are we concerned about our reputation or God's reputation? We may not be doing so well as a church, but God looks great if we really understand his actions. How we practiced Way, have we practiced ways of speaking to people about how wonderful God is? We need to practice ways of saying that. Shouldn't that be a major theme in our gatherings together in Sabbath school and church? Well, Hebrews 10, 25 says this, Let us hold on firmly to the hope we profess because we can trust God to keep His promise. Let us be concerned for one another, to help one another, to show love and to do good. Let us not give up the habit of meeting together as some are doing. Instead, let us encourage one another all the more since you see that the day of the Lord is coming nearer. So that wouldn't that suggest that we ought to be doing that even more than others in the past? Aren't we closer to the kingdom? Church gatherings should be especially useful for this purpose. 
So, well, how are we how are we using the gifts that God has given us? Galatians six nine and ten says, um, "So let us not become tired of doing good, for if we do not give up, the time will come when we reap the harvest. So then, as often as we have the chance, we should do good to everyone, and especially to those who belong to our family in the faith." So there is a little bit of distinction there. Paul says we need to do good to everyone, but especially to our members of the church. Are our Sabbath school classes organized and conducted in such a way as to encourage discussion and real thinking among the church members? Okay, Jackie? It is not the opposition of the world that most endangers the Church of Christ. It is the evil cherished in the hearts of believers that works their most grievous disaster and most surely retards the progress of God's cause. Wow. There is no surer way of weakening spirituality than by cherishing envy, suspicion, fault-finding, and evil surmising. On the other hand, the strongest witness that God has sent His Son into the world is the existence of harmony and union among men of varied dispositions who form his church. This witness, it is the privilege of the followers of Christ to bear. But in order to do this, they must place themselves under Christ's command. Their characters must be conformed to his character and their wills to his will. Acts wow. of the Apostles. Kenneth? And Minister of Healing uh, 104, uh, second paragraph. The work which the disciples did, we also are to do. Every Christian is to be a missionary. In sympathy and compassion, we are to minister to those in need of help, seeking with unselfish earnestness to lighten the woes of suffering humanity. We are to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, and comfort the suffering and afflicted. We are to minister to the despairing and to inspire hope in the hopeless. The love of Christ, manifest in unselfish ministry, will be more effective in reforming the evil doer than will the work, uh, the sword, or the court of justice. Often, the heart that hardens under reproof will melt under the love of Christ. Wow, what a statement! She made some amazing statements. Margaret, I think you have. Yeah, here's if I could interject yeah, in response sure. to that, we we've been watching. Um, SoCal camp meeting evening mm -hmm. uh, on LLBN, and the, last night the, the story was told about a woman in a grocery store, and uh, the other lady in the same aisle, she was suddenly uh, impressed to give her a tract. Mm -hmm. So she asked her if she would like this tract, and the woman said, is that Christian? And she said, well, yes, it is. <laughs> she says, well, then I can't take it. I'm a Jehovah's <laughs> Witness. To which the lady turned around and said, said something like, you know, I love, you know. Well, then can I give you a hug? And, you know, and then she hugged her and I love you. And then the lady said, well, maybe I will take the track. <laughs> <laughs> Great story. Good. So there's that, that reaching out and, you know, if they, they know that you love them. Then yeah. Yeah, I... I, I, I have the privilege of hugging a lot of people every day. A lot of my... <laughs> no, serious. A lot of my patients and my staff, they want hugs. <laughs> Margaret, you think uh, you can add is, something? Yeah, this is from Acts of the Apostles, uh, page 551, paragraph 1 and 2. The completeness of Christian character is attained when the impulse to help and bless others springs constantly from within. It is the atmosphere of this love surrounding the soul of the believer that makes him a savor of life unto life and enables God to bless his work. Supreme love for God and unselfish love for one another, this is the best gift that our Heavenly Father can bestow. This love is not an impulse, but a divine principle, a permanent power. The unconsecrated heart cannot originate or produce it. Only in the heart where Jesus reigns is it found. Wow. I love it. 
Think about this. The completeness of Christian characters attain when the impulse to help and bless others springs constantly from within. Is that something that we can learn? Can we learn to constantly be thinking, how can I reach out to someone else? What can I do to help somebody? Well, only if we keep the Lord, Lord ever before us, because it's not something... That's not made of trust. <coughs> no. Yeah, it's not <laughs> something that we have by nature. But, it's, but it's that, but that something God gives to yeah. us. It's something that's feasible. It's something that we understand that, that could happen to us. Yes. Do we as Seventh-day Adventists have a unique, new, unique and important message for the world? What is implied and included in the three angels' messages? Seventh-day Adventists are known around the world as being people of the book. We also have a very powerful health message, which can literally extend the lives and improve the health of people. More than that, we have an understanding of the great controversy which helps to explain so many challenging parts of the Bible. Have you ever been a part of a church which is doing several of these things and actively recruiting new members? How does that make you feel? We have looked at the example of the early Christians in the early early disciples in the early church, Christian church as the early reign and used that as an example for what might happen in the latter reign. Think of the, of the experience of Jesus with his disciples in the upper room washing their dirty feet. Do you think the disciples were quick to follow the example of Jesus given on that occasion? Probably. Do you think they all were trying to rush each other's, rushing to wash each other's feet on the next occasion? No. No. Well, after Not for several days. Yeah, after the after Pentecost, I think, <coughs> or uh, leading up leading up to Pentecost, perhaps. What are we doing as individuals and as a group to serve the community in ways that lead to the sharing of the gospel? Research has shown that people who b belong to a regular faith community and attend religious services regularly live longer lives. We do. What do you think that? Why do you think that is? God wants to keep them around. <laughs> God, there you go. <laughs> do you ever feel like you're being called to commit yourself in so many ways that you become exhausted? We talked about that a little. Mm -hmm. Research has shown that people who are actively helping others experience what is called a helper's high. What is a helper's high? It makes you feel good. More than that, it results in a sharp reduction in the stress due to the results of endorphins, the body's natural painkillers. So when you reach out to help others, you are helping yourself. One of the best passages talk, take, one of the best passages talking about the way in which Jesus humbled himself is found in, in Philippians 2, 5 to 11. And it talks there, we don't have time to read it, about Jesus, the king of the universe, Stepping down finally to the point where he died the death of a common criminal. Wow. Some people have called the message of Christianity and the real message of Christianity an upside down gospel. What do we know about that? Jim, I think that's you. This is from a scholar named Robert Banks, quoted in his uh, book, Full Service Movie, from self-surf Christianity to total servanthood. And this is quoted in a, our study guide on page 173. But here's a quote. What we need today are not, as is so often suggested, more servant leaders, but properly understood, more leading servants. <laughs> okay. Wow. And what would be the difference between a servant leader and a leading servant? Well, this is Prophets and Kings. We may bring this back next quarter mm -hmm. uh, when we study Ezra and Nehemiah. But Nehemiah's whole soul was in the enterprise he had undertaken. His hope, his energy, his enthusiasm, his determination were contagious, inspiring others with the same high courage and lofty purpose. Each man, this is the servant, uh, the other part of that. Each man became a Nehemiah in his turn and helped to make stronger the heart and hand of his neighbor. So it Very good, yeah. Prophets and Kings 6, well, 38. Unfortunately, there are bad servants as well as good servants. We clearly understand the upside-down philosophy that Christ was trying to teach. Do we clearly to teach his followers? 
John 15, 15 is an amazing verse. We could talk about it the rest of the night. I do not call you servants any longer because servants do not know what their master is doing. Instead, I call you friends because I have told you everything I have heard from my Father. Imagine the implications of that. God himself wants us to be friends. Well, for one thing, if we are friends of God, we will always be prepared to speak up on behalf of his reputation. I mean, what do you do when you hear one of your friends being belittled by somebody else? Do you try to speak up on their behalf? Do you try to defend their reputation? Shouldn't we be doing that for God? Well, his disciples couldn't even imagine what it would be like to live without Jesus. But when he died that awful death and that arose in his own power on Sunday morning, they began to get a better picture of who he really was. And when he ascended to heaven, they must have had a fruit basket upset. And they're thinking to imagine that their personal friend Jesus was actually God. Can you think of Jesus as our friend? Often our larger churches have a number of different programs going on. How well do these programs work together? Jordan, I think you're going to finish up there for us. Desire of Ages, 640. Millions upon millions of human souls ready to perish, bound in chains of ignorance and sin, have never so much as heard of Christ's love for them. Were our condition and theirs to be reversed, what would we desire them to do for us? All this, so far as lies in our power, we are under the most solemn obligation to do for them. Wow. Christ's rule of life, by which one by which every one of us must stand or fall in the judgment is, whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. The Savior has given his precious life in order to establish a church capable of caring for sorrowful, tempted souls. Wow. So God has organized a church on this earth, and that church has one mission. What's that one mission? He wants us to to work to save as many of his human children as possible. Are we doing that? Are you doing that? Can you do that? Could we all do it? And what would happen if we really did? Our kind and wonderful Father, it's a privilege to have this opportunity to speak up on your behalf. May each one of us gain the insights that you are offering through these passages and may we find ways in which we can speak up on your behalf to, rep- to, to correctly represent your character each day as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.